Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. 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 Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 14. Today we're talking about the $1 trillion business travel market. Asia is the biggest player in that market, but are traditional hotels keeping up with demand, providing the kind of experiences that the modern business traveler wants? Asia Tech Podcast, voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. Okay, so today I wanted to talk about what I call the professionalization and maybe even the consolidation of what I'll call short-term options for travelers, right? Like, where do you stay? Do you stay in a hotel? Yeah. Use the Airbnb? Like, how does this thing develop and how does it develop in Asia? I think that's a really interesting concept. And I wanted to put it in the context of eBay. Mm. So you might be asking yourself, what's the relationship between short-term stay and eBay? And really, to me, it's just this whole concept of professionalization. Mm. You just go back a little bit. You think that eBay started with Pierre Omidar's wife. At least this is the... Um, the story that people like to tell, the founding story, right? The origin story. Had a Pez collection. We right. just wanted to trade other Pez with other people. And then people started buying it. And then they had the whole idea of let's put things up for auction. So if you had, you know, two copies of the Beatles' White Album, you really only needed one. So you put one up for auction and it was a time limit and there was excitement built around it. And so people went to eBay to sort of have that kind of fun. And then you know, people found out that there was this frictionless way that they could sell things online and people started getting interested and then they realized, wait a second, over time, I can make a real business out of this. Mm -hmm. So then individuals started trying to become eBay sellers and kind of got halfway there. And then real existing businesses said, you know what, instead of building my own platform, I have goods for sale, whether they're secondhand goods or things that I just can't sell or actually my real goods. Let me put them on eBay. Now I don't have like a local business. Now I've got a national business. Let's see what happens. And that was kind of what I'll call the professionalization of eBay, right, in kind of a quick scope. But what it meant was the original people on eBay were just amateurs. Mm -hmm. And it was meant to be that way at first. And then it kind of got a little bit professionalized, like, okay, I think I have more to sell than just an old copy of the Beatles White Album. I'm going to start doing it. And then real people that had real businesses said, I'm using this platform because I don't want to build it myself. So the amateurs went in there. They established it. They they kind of worked it out for everybody. You know, they ironed out all the creases early on, right? And then these sort of semi professionals came in, realized there was money to be made, established the business models. People saw these business models, started copying them, improving them, and it became a money maker for people. And that's the point at which it gains traction. So, how does that now work in the the travel market? Well, let's back up again for one second and just mention, yeah, you, you, you hit on a whole bunch of really good things. They solved two other really important problems. One of them was, how do I pay for that for someone I've never met before? Where do I send that money? Hmm. Right. So they solved the payment problem. But they also solved this problem of, OK, maybe 90 percent of the people from whom I buy will actually ship me the thing that they said they were going to ship me. But how can I trust them? Right. So you have this trust problem that eBay helped solve. And then that moved into the sort of the professional realm. How does that work in travel? Well, let's again go back to the founding story of Airbnb. Mm. Right. Short term stay. I don't want to stay at a hotel or I can't afford to stay at a hotel. You know, my cousin Frank has like an extra bed. I'm going to have my friends stay there, but they're going to have to pay for it or sleep on the couch. Right? right. But again, how do you handle the trust? How do you handle the payments? How do you handle all of those things? Well, some of the online social and community building things had already been established, but nobody really thought this was going to be a big business. So you had a lot of amateurs come in. Okay, I've got an apartment in Manhattan that I don't use three months out of the year. Let me rent that out to an Airbnb. I'll manage it myself or I'll have my cousin come down and take care of cleaning the sheets and do that kind of thing. But again, it was the same thing. You can substitute that sublet apartment in Manhattan or in Los Angeles for the Pez. Right. It kind of feels like the same thing to me. But then what happened? Well, then people said, wait a second. I know there are regulatory issues around this and stuff, but it's going to be hard to get me. And if I actually am making money from this, so why don't I just buy like six one-bedroom apartments or studio apartments in a building, and then I hire my cousin as opposed to just asking my cousin to manage those six apartments. They clean it. They do the laundry and stuff. They get it ready. Maybe they'll pick up the person downstairs and give them the key. 
And it's still kind of an amateur style business, mm. but it's almost like halfway there again, right? Again, it's like when some of the eBay people realized, oh, I can actually use this as a platform. Right. And this this is the point where you go to the networking events, isn't it? And you somebody at a meetup or networking event gets up and says, yeah, no, I've been doing this now for a couple of years where I've been buying apartments and rent. How much money are you making again? And people's ears prick up, and then they realize, actually, there's a living to be made out of this. That's how it spreads, isn't it? That's the point at which it starts getting into the media. Sure. And then you start seeing stories about this, and then there's a big market for people to go out and buy 6, 10, 12, whatever it is, apartments, right. mostly studios. If you want to mimic sort of the hotel experience, but at a lower price level with maybe slightly better service or more personalized service, right? Like there's a picture of someone's family in the room or, or whatever it is, right? And there's a refrigerator there where the water's free or some such thing. But that's kind of when it gets to be a little bit professional. But the thing that hasn't happened yet in the Airbnb space, at least not that I've noticed, right? Um, it, or or is, is that someone's actually professionalized the whole thing and said, full stop, there are existing spaces out there that were purpose built just for this. Mm. So not an amateur graduating into, you know, going from five apartments to 50 apartments, but there are big buildings out there, whether they're service apartments for professionals or just short term stay places, or even literally like hotel extra rooms at hotels that just have not been booked. Mm. And now you're starting to see this whole thing change, right? So I think the beginning of it was probably Hotel Tonight in the United States and a company called Hotel Quickly out here. But again, I believe that that's like short term stay 1.0. Right. Right. It's not 100% professional yet. And the hotels aren't in, like, they're not on board 100%, but they have an idea that this might work. So, how does that change? Well, here's how it changes the whole thing gets professionalized. You take um, a company who has a short-term residence, right? That's what it's built for. That's what the whole thing is. They already have all the service set up, but they have excess inventory. This is load balancing on an airline or the same thing on a cruise ship or same thing on Amtrak or whatever train line it is, right? Is how do I get my inventory to have the most possible use, right? How do I load balance? How do I do all that stuff? Well, here's what happens. You get the creation of a company called Metro Residences. Hmm. And this company is, you know, grew out of this whole concept of there are places, you know, in Singapore, because this company was based in Singapore, that where there are service departments that go unsold. And they said, let's go out and let's professionalize the whole thing. So instead of taking your cousin's apartment or six apartments that your friend has, or even 15 apartments that like your uncle has, we're just going to go to places that are purposely built for it and create a platform for them. And you're going to hear me use this word platform a lot because we can go over every single business that I like that gets invested and they're all platforms just like this one. Okay. So if you go and then look at this story that I was talking about or that I mentioned um, about this business, you can see this, com this company, right, was just invested. Mm -hmm. So Metro Residence recently just took a Series A funding from some really good investors that are in the travel business. So Ruck10 is an investor in their Series A for about $2.8 million, right? This company's been around just the right amount of time, a little bit over two years. They've proved that this actually works. They've got some revenue, some traction, and now they're going to use their Series A money to grow this thing out, okay? But this is really important because, again, another business that I love that fits into both two categories, right? One is professionalization, and two is a platform that can scale anywhere. Right. And these investors as well, Rakuten, uh, they're a platform themselves, right? That's their business. That's where they've established their name, isn't it? So they understand this idea of building out a platform. Well, so Rakuten one, runs one of the biggest OTAs and one of the biggest um, travel platforms in Japan. And what that means is they run one of the biggest travel platforms in Southeast Asia. They know this space really well. And this adds on top of their platform already that gives them hotel bookings. But Metro Residences, remember, operates right now just in Singapore. Okay. And they have 400 apartments in their portfolio. And they've done 115,000 bookings, right? And you always have to get the what I call the other side of the trade. Who's the other side? What you do is you go to a corporation, 
right? So now instead of that corporation saying, oh, do I call this service department? Do I call that service department? There's a travel team there. Now all they do is they just log on and ask you if you're an executive traveling to Singapore for three weeks, where do you want to stay? Where are most of your meetings? Give me all your criteria and I'll book you something here and it'll be 40% cheaper than it was last year because now we're using this platform, mm-hmm. right? And that to me is an amazing business model because as a former executive in a big company, making those travel plans was always really hard. And remember, these big companies, these big corporations have all these policies around where you can stay and how much money you can, all, and all this stuff. And they're kind of indifferent to where you're going to be hmm. when you're in any particular city. But because of the way this platform works, you can actually work together with your internal travel department to figure out the best place for you to stay because you're already getting the discount. So you have both sides of this trade, right? A place like Metro Residences goes out to a corporation, pick anyone you want, right? Singapore Press Holdings. You're going on a, you're having somebody come in from the United States on a business trip. You easily log on to the site from your corporate, right? So you white label it as well. You log in, you book your thing, it's done. And not only have you made somebody happy, they show up in an apartment, which probably has a kitchen, which means they feel more like they're at home than they do on a business trip necessarily. Hmm. It's just the whole concept of this really, really works for me. We'll throw in a few stats here just to give us a bit of context. There's a report by McKinsey and co out recently about the business travel market focusing on Asia. And they say that Asia is the world's biggest business travel market accounting for a third of all the global spend. Makes sense. Biggest travel market. But here's an interesting thing as well, is that how the business travel market is evolving, especially in Asia. And they said that 69% of respondents that they surveyed said that they were able to choose their airlines, but 74% said that they had the same degree of freedom in picking their hotel. So these are executives. Your guy going to Singapore... Now he can choose the hotel. So he's just got to go back to the travel department within his organization, say, that's the hotel that I want. Go ahead and make the arrangement for me. So when you're getting that kind of freedom, if somebody's going to go to somewhere like Metro Residences and say, yeah, no, I stayed there last time I went to Singapore. They had a kitchenette, just like home. It was very comfortable, better than living in a hotel for a week. That's the kind of thing that people to come back to again and again, right? Yeah, I mean, most people, when they're, when they're in their own home city and they're going to their office every day, they like to shower in their own place. They don't like hotel rooms are just so retro in my mind, right? Yeah. There's so many things in a hotel room that you don't need, that big thing that covers up the television set potentially, or even a television set at all. A trouser press. I mean, <laughs> really? Yeah, a trouser press is in hotel rooms. I mean, anyway, anyway it's another thing. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I think we're, you know, but you're talking about a, maybe a, a different generation of business traveler, right? Who may be used sure. to different experiences and expectations. Right. But I like the fact that a company is purposely built in the travel space for Asia, with Asia accounting for one third of the world's business travel, right? I mean, a trillion dollars, you talk about 300 and something million dollars for business travel. And that means that this is the perfect place to start this. And maybe in this case, right, I generally have a little bit of a bias against companies that start in Singapore because I think it's too easy. But in the and that's in relative terms, right, because none of these companies are either easy to start or easy to become successful. But in this particular case and with this type of platform, okay, the things that they learn in Singapore, I believe, are very easily transferable to the rest of the region because there are – you know, the Ascot has apartments in the Philippines. It probably has apartments that are short-term stay, service apartments in, um, you know, in Jakarta, also in KL. And to the extent that they have excess inventory, they can get that stuff booked here. And because it doesn't rely on the moving of physical goods and logistics, this is the perfect business to start in Singapore. There's money there to fund it, but there's also a way to test it in your own home and in your own neighborhood. And if you go look at the um, the Metro Residences site, it breaks stuff down by neighborhood, probably by price as well. And what they're doing too, right, is they're presuming that you have a decent enough budget and they're still discounting a little bit because in the same way, right, that airlines would want to sell their last 50 seats, they're happy to sell them at any price in a way. Mm. 
these short sort of short term residences, right? If they can't book them months in advance, they're happy to sell them kind of at any price just to fill out their inventory. Right. I don't know. I really like this a lot. Go ahead. Talking about airlines, if you go back to, I know you mentioned these guys before, like Priceline, because they were, you know, they've come up as one of the big dot flops in the the past, right? They, you know, they have Priceline were the guys, I think started by the same guy who started the Borders bookstores, right? And I think the whole idea of Priceline was that you would, if you were an airline, you would load balance, you would offload your inventory at any price to travelers. But the whole idea was that, you know, you would, I think the airlines had this issue that they didn't want to sell one ticket at, a, you know, a fraction of what the other ticket cost because then you'd get a whole bunch of travelers who'd wait until, you know, a certain cutoff point where they could get this stuff really cheap. They could get like the last mm-hmm. minute bargains. So they'd yes. say that they'd create this wall in between the airline and the traveler such that a, you had to kind of bid for these tickets and then, you know, you didn't know whether you were going to get them or not. So there was no guarantee. And also sometimes you didn't even know what airline you were going to fly. Those kind of like crazy sort of, right. that sort of transparency was not there. So Priceline tried to deal with that market by, you know, making it a more perfect market, allowing people to offsell their their inventory at any price just to fill it all out because it was all effectively extra money at the end of the day, which was an empty seat, right? right. And that didn't seem to work. How is this going to work in this market? How is it different? Yeah, I mean, so the, the way the pricing mechanism work, works, I believe, is different, right? If, if I understood what you said correctly about Priceline, it was like you didn't know where you were going to stay. So I used to travel with a guy in Thailand we used to go to Singapore a lot, and I would always book a hotel on, you know, on Club Street. It was a hundred and something dollars a night. It was cheap, but it was nice, and it was very convenient for me. And we went down there three or four times together, and I always said to him, "Okay, where are you going to stay?" And his answer was, at least a day or so before, "I don't know. I've put in a bid on Priceline, right? And I'm waiting for them to come back to me." So I think in that model, I, I don't think that model is going to work here. But what I do think works is is that in the same way that Agoda, right, has a lot of data around which hotels have how many people staying in them at which time, so what their loads are, right, what their occupancy rates are, I believe that there should be enough data so that places like the Ascot or other service departments can have a decent understanding about when their peaks and when their valleys are. And I think that in that case, they'll just give their inventory to these booking mechanisms and they'll pay for CAC, right? We talk about cost of acquiring a customer. We talk about this a lot in the context of online sort of digital selling. If I've got to put up a billboard or put up a television commercial or radio commercial or advertise at the beginning or the end of a movie, I'm paying something for that. And I don't understand its efficacy because I can't get real-time feedback on it. Hmm. But if I make some calculation that it costs me and I'm going to make up a number, right? $47 to acquire a customer, I'm willing to pay that to a broker in size if they can always guarantee me that that $47 spent is going to give me a client. And I think in this case, this type of platform will mean that inventory will get allocated to um, metro residences, right? And they'll take that inventory and they'll just try to sell it. So they'll do the same thing, but they've now taken on the responsibility as a marketing agent to do the lead gen for these places. And the Clearly, someone thinks they're going to be successful using that pricing model. And I would use it. I would try to use this thing right away. I've been down, like I said earlier, I've been to Singapore on business. I've been to KL. I've been to Jakarta. <clears throat> and I don't like necessarily booking into a hotel. I'd much rather stay in a place that feels more like an apartment, sit on a couch, have a kitchen, have a table, a dining room table where I can sit and use the thing rather than sitting on some bad chair, even in an expensive hotel and using the facilities that are there, most of which was set up or conceptualized 40 years ago for some completely different reason. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather stay in a studio apartment in a real building and interact with real people. So I don't don't have a problem with this business model at all. And I think if they're going to price it the way I expect them to price it, unless I'm missing something, I don't think this is going to be a big deal. Now, what what do you think about short lets being banned in particular places, in particular cities, or in particular countries what's what's the angle there 
Yeah, there's been a, quite a few instances of this, hasn't there? There's, there's a few in Asia, and we've got sort of precedent. There's some cities in the U.S. that have had, I mean, I know San Francisco had a long run-in with Airbnb. But I don't think it was San Francisco that made the change. It was one of the cities to the south. I don't know if it's San Diego or somewhere down there, which basically San Clemente, that had uh, that introduced some kind of regulation, which basically, it it you know it affected the Airbnb market in their city significantly, where they said that the landlord, the owner, had to live in the apartment for a certain percentage yeah. of the yeah. year. And now we're starting yeah. to see similar kind of things in other cities. And I know Singapore's had some recent legislation. It's one of those things, though, Michael, that, yeah, that will go into practice, but I think landlords will find ways around it, right? They'll turn up at the right times to be seen to be living in there. They'll get bills in their name and that kind of thing. It will just be an inconvenience rather than a showstopper. It's hard, though. I know you bring up a really good point, and I hadn't thought about it in this context, right? But I know a guy who lives between Los Angeles and, and Bangkok. Okay, he's in the television production business, right? So he's doing things in, in both countries. And... He had this amazing apartment, he said, like a street off the beach in Los Angeles. But he was renting it from an owner. And he said, oh, I have to be out of the country for four or five months a year contiguously, right? So all in a row. And I said, why don't you just have your sister live in it? He said, legally, I cannot do that. I cannot even let my sister live in it for free, if I remember the conversation correctly, because the renter has to live physically in the apartment. And he said, under no circumstances can I sublet that apartment. Right. And this gets back to your concept of that thing is just banned. And you're right. You can try to get around it. But I believe that both parties actually get in trouble. Right. Right. So it's not just like in the case of that, like that, the that the renter gets in trouble. I think the owner gets in trouble, too, for not properly following the regulations. Mm. Now, this is a this is an interesting problem, right? For companies that are kind of pushing the borders of, of the regulatory environment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the best example of this globally has to be Uber. Yeah, right. Right, because taxi companies and the taxi laws that govern them are a hundred and something years old. Hmm. And they never conceptualize the fact that someone would have a mobile phone with an app on it to, to, um, to order a car. Right. So I believe someone said, I was listening to somebody talk a couple of days ago, and they said actually there was a law in Florida that said that Livery cars literally had to go back to the garage after every drop off. <laughs> that made sense a hundred years ago. It might have, maybe because you want to see if the driver was drunk, or maybe they needed to go there to get gasoline or right. something. But I think it exists as well in in um, in London. Obviously, the famous for the black cab, which are called I still think they're called hackney carriages officially. I <laughs> think I think it's. They still have to, by law, and somebody, uh, you can tweet us to let us know. They still have to, by law, carry a, bay of, uh, a bale of hay in the, the trunk of the car. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me in the least, actually. So, you know, I don't think anybody has been brought up and arrested on that charge for the last, I don't know how many years. But it just shows you how old these legacy laws are. And they never seem to, they never seem to work out. At the end of the day, you talk about Uber. And Airbnb as well. The, the success of these companies globally, it really just comes down to PR, doesn't it? And Absolutely. Airbnb is much better at this than Uber. But it's just a PR exercise. You know, these incumbent taxi service firms, and it's going to be the same with, you know, the, the local landlords or whoever it is in the local city, whoever is fighting against, you know, these companies coming in. It's just a PR exercise, isn't it? They just have to learn how to do PR properly and win over fans rather than fight these people or rather go pig headed because they're dealing with local authorities and local authorities do not get thing ideas like platforms and disintermediation and so on. These are bad words for them. Completely. And, and look, you know, I think it was in New York where they fought really hard against Airbnb and there are a lot of rules around condos and I forget what the other things are called, but like the owner has to be there. You can't rent it out. You can't sell it to anyone you want regardless of money. There was a story back in the 90s of Madonna having a problem buying into one of the buildings where she wanted to live because the people that lived there had lived there for 25 years and didn't want to be bothered by paparazzi. So it didn't matter whether you could afford it or not. It wasn't a rich or poor thing. It was more like a privacy thing. Mm. And, you know, there are a lot of these businesses that get built where 
you can't simply just install the app or install the business plan in a sp in a new locality because the local area has different regulations. And I think I was listening to this the CEO of Nextdoor, who was a very experienced um, entrepreneur, this guy Nirav Tolia, and he was saying, look, he, after getting to 150 cities in the United States, they wanted to move to the UK and move to Europe. But neighborhoods had a different character, a different naming convention, and a, you know different ideas about how those neighborhoods worked, mm. which meant that they had to they couldn't just install the product. And I think that Metro Residences is going to find the same thing too. You can't just throw it up there and say this is available. Mm. Anytime you're running a business that's uniquely local, that exists in the locality and has some sort of physicality to it, you're going to have to tweak it to fit what those local customs are. I don't think they're gonna have a problem with this, and I think I'm already on record as saying, I really like this business. Right. Um, well, I like the model. I think it's a great yeah. model, you know. I think you've got, you've also got parallels with this. I'm starting to see this kind of model appear in the private let market as well. Tell where me. Where you have, let's say the traditional model is a landlord buys a property and then does what's called a buy to let, lets it out to somebody, a tenant, right? So the landlord's responsible for buying, you know, sourcing the property, investing, raising the money, all these, you know, end to end effectively, as well as, you know, decorating, you know, making sure it fits the needs of the tenant, advertising it, giving it to an agent and so on. So sure. that's the traditional model. But what's happening now is because there's enough margin in the rental market. So there's enough sort of money to play with, if you like. What landlords are doing and i've done this myself is they're turning to special intermediaries i suppose or people like you know as you said who are working with metro residents and they what they're doing is they're basically saying look to the landlords we'll take your property and we'll look after this property we'll lease it from you for five years for example we'll lease it from you for five years we'll fill it with tenants you know and we'll pay you this much every month guaranteed for this amount of time, you know, yeah. we'll do all the managing the tenants, we'll do all the, you know, looking after the property and so on. So effectively, what they've done is say the landlord, you focus on what you're good at, that's buying the property, looking after the building, and that's it. You know, we'll do all the rest, we'll look after the inside of the building, we'll make an experience that the, the tenant wants. And we'll do all the relationship and the payment with the tenant. So it's kind of a similar model where you're just basically saying, right, you focus on what you're good at, we'll focus on what we're good at, and at the end of the day, we'll make the best possible experience for the customer. Right. Yeah, and again, that just gets back to professionalizing the whole thing, right? The, the, only, the only thing about that is that, you're again, you're creating a middleman in a place where it's really not necessary for a middleman to exist, right? Hmm. No. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose, I mean, whoever owns the building, I mean, the metro residences, do they, are they filling out their inventory? If not, then they need a middleman, right? Yeah, I guess so, right? I mean, I guess so. But I'm just talking about the professionalization of that middleman. Like, I just want to see the properties dealing directly with the platform, hmm. not have to have somebody in between it if, if that's necessary. Right. right? So are there also, are, I wonder if there are new laws being created to sort of prevent this whole thing from happening. The bottom line is, this thing is going to happen. And it's going to keep happening as well, right? Like, again, a hotel is something that was invented a thousand years ago. You know, built at a crossroads that was normally set up for other reasons besides just staying overnight. And now people really just want to travel for business, stay in a place and do that. It'll be interesting for me to see how the regulatory environment catches up with the actual market. No? Yeah, well, I think your point about hotels being something invented a long time ago might be, you know, why these models might well work. Because I don't know if hotels are set up. I mean, I guess this is one reason why Airbnb has been successful is because it's not just about providing a place to stay. It's also about providing an experience, isn't it, for some travelers. There's a whole bunch of travelers who now want an experience. They want some kind of interaction. They want that kind of personalization, which hotels can't deliver. So in a way, you know, I know a good friend of mine, a very successful Airbnb host in San Francisco. He has a whole number of properties. He's one of their top hosts in San Francisco. Right. And the reason is, is because he says he just focuses on experience. You know, and that's maybe where hotels, are, are they designed to create? I know they're sort of the modern boutique hotels have been created, but your average business hotel, 
isn't really designed to create the kind of experience your average business customer wants. I don't know. Maybe that's where they're missing out because they they've got a, a, a legacy model. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. If you think about it, like most people don't spend that much time in a hotel room anyway. So what happened? What the room provides itself is secondary to the experience you get when you're interacting with the property overall, right? How can they help you get to where you want to go? How can they give you really good information? How can they personalize it for you? Maybe it's your birthday when you're there. Do you know what I mean? But there are things that they can do that make it feel more personal. And that's why your friend in San Francisco as a super host is so good. Yeah. Because they're creating an experience for somebody. You're you're a seasoned business traveler. I mean, (laughs) myself as well, I've done a lot of business travel. And I just wondered, I mean, at what point did hotels really get with the program and realize actually that Wi-Fi in the room was a necessity. It wasn't just sort of like a bonus for your business travel. I mean, that was quite late in the game, wasn't it? I, mean, I don't know what kind of cities you travel to, but... Super late. <laughs> Super late. It would be like charging you for the television set. Right, want... right. Or using the bathroom. Maybe you put coins a... in every time you went in. I'll, I'll tell you this, though. You, know, you may know this from living in Japan. There are still some inns, yeah. right? Some ryokan in Japan where it's still like 100 yen for 30 minutes of television. <laughs> Those machines still exist. Every time I see one, I laugh. But you're right. Wi-Fi right. is like, would they charge you for the lights? Yeah. Right? Or they would they charge you for the television? No, you get like cable TV because the whole building has cable. Yeah. Right? So the, they shouldn't charge you for Wi-Fi either. And again, the same thing. So you go into somebody's Airbnb or you go use Metro Residences, all that stuff set up. You don't have to worry about it. It's all taken care of for you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I think that is where, you know, and even if you were to look at players like, if you compare Airbnb versus a traditional hotel, you know, the Airbnb that works, the the hosts, I guess, are more dynamic. They're able to react to customers' needs a lot faster. You know, they know what people want, that when you turn up to the place, they have all that installed. They have all the instructions put out for you. They've got your welcome bag ready for you with the bottle of wine and the goodies in it and so on and the maps to the local areas and so on. So they're already, they're, you know, they're set up to do that. And yes. Think, you know, that's kind of where hotels are sort of playing catch up. And that's why Metro Residences as well is in a good position because, you know, they're focused now on what they're going to be good at, which is focused on the customer experience from the business traveler side, right? Yeah, and again, because they're building a platform, they're going to get a lot of data as well, right? Mm. So they're going to be able to build frequent flyer programs or you know any of these kind of benefits and perk programs. You'll be able to get points to be able to use this. If they're smart, they'll build a whole infrastructure around a credit card that just is Metro Residence brand. So no matter where you stay in the world, if you use the Metro Residence's brand or use their card, you get all these extra benefits. There's a way to build a new thing like this that in the old days only American Express or Visa or MasterCard can do. But if they get enough scale, and this is a business that I believe can scale. In other words, the investors who did this were actually, who invest in this, I think were quite smart. So whoever got to see this first and test it out, I think did a really, really good job. Um, from the investment side, but there are so many other things you can build on this, right? Now you have a platform. Yeah. And the more people you get on the platform, the more things, you, the more good services, right, you can sell to them. But you can also understand as well. Here's the other thing, too. Once you get all this data, if Metro Residences is, is, has, is really ambitious, right, maybe they build their own places. Mm. Because maybe they have enough data, maybe they're closer to the clients than some of these other existing services or these existing um, short stay places. And maybe they can outmaneuver them as well. Maybe they buy them. Mm-hmm. In other words, this is a potentially a really, really large business, right? The question for me is, I know Airbnb does this and Uber does this in the sense that we don't own any inventory. We just manage the inventory and take a little bit of a vig. But in some cases, owning that inventory and controlling it gives you control over quality as well. Yeah. And sometimes having control over quality allows you to charge a higher price. So imagine a situation where there's just regular Airbnb where, again, you stay at some lady's apartment and she manages it herself or she has three properties. Or then you move into kind of your friend in San Francisco where they have 10 properties and they kind of manage it semi-professionally. 
Mm. Right. And then there's somebody who just goes out and buys 25 properties. But what if there's premium Airbnb? Okay. And I had a conversation with somebody about this today, which is why I find it really interesting. Let's say you do premium Airbnb. Okay. And you create a very, very sort of high end experience one room at a time. Mm-hmm. So, so you use the Airbnb infrastructure and their booking mechanism and their paying mechanism. But instead of having just a one room studio apartment, you have this sort of penthouse somewhere. And that's all you do, right? So your Graham Brown's penthouse is using the Airbnb platform. Hmm. And whether it's in Dubai or in Paris or in New York or in Los Angeles or in Bangkok or in Singapore or in Tokyo, you only have the best of the best, but you don't have to manage it yourself anymore. You don't have to go through Lux properties or whatever it is. You use the entire Airbnb infrastructure because there's payments, there's ratings and all the other things that you might not get with another platform. And now you're running this super high-end business when you're using somebody else's platform to do it. Or Airbnb does it itself and they brand those apartments on their own. In other words, the potential there is huge hmm. if you can do it right. So Airbnb would actually own the inventory? They could do it if they wanted to, right? Because they can... Who, because they have more data than everybody else. In other words, no individual owner, right, or Airbnb host is going to have as much data as Airbnb does itself. Right. Right. And one of the things you can do on the internet, remember, and Priceline, getting back to what we discussed earlier, pioneered this is you can change prices. So they can test prices in real time. Will somebody pay a thousand dollars a night for this? Mm. Will they pay thirteen hundred? Where is it? How can I test it? They'll know that better than any individual host. And depending on how much information they share with their hosts, they can have either the highest end properties or the most low end properties. And because they operate at scale, they may be able to get services for those apartments at a rate that's cheaper, which means that their profit margin is higher. Mm -hmm. Then they make money multiple ways. They make money off the exact renting of those apartments. They're paying lower management costs than some of their hosts. Right? And you can see the way this can work right, for metro residences as well. Maybe they buy the building and they super manage it on their own. Right? Because let's just pick a company, the Ascot. The Ascot only knows data about its own places. Mm. But maybe they're doing other things less efficiently than some other short-term stay or service department. But they don't have that data. But see, metro residences will. Mm-hmm. And I think we, we forget how important that data is for these hotels, right? Because there isn't a lot that a hotel can do. I mean, it can't change the hotel building. That's pretty much set. That's fixed. They can't change the room layouts. You know, they've been like that for the last 20 years in most cases. So they only have the data to go with, right? That's often the only thing that a hotel can use to improve the near term, right? So, you know, it's how do they manage their inventory a little bit better? How do they reduce leakage here? How do they improve the experience for the guest? And that all comes down to the data, which for us, you might look at it and think, well, what's that in terms of value to a hotel? Well, actually, it's probably the only thing that they have. Yeah, exactly. And you said it earlier. You cannot, if you're an Airbnb host and you have a property somewhere that's not generating revenue for you, you can sell it, right? But if you're a hotel with 300 rooms, yeah. Like the market for buyers of that type of property is much lower than the market for buyers of a two-bedroom apartment in the central part of town. Yeah. So your flexibility is, is not this at the same level, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just find, again, because they're building a platform and the more traction their platform gets, the barriers to entry get higher, right? Again, they're creating Kleenex. That's what they're doing. And that's why I love that those businesses so much because once you establish that as the brand – People will talk about it in the office. Hey, dude, have you booked your thing with Metro Residences? Hmm. I heard this is already staying. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter. You won't even know necessarily which place you're staying at. You know where you, how you booked it. Right? I mean, Agoda did a great job of this with hotels, right? I'm hmm. staying in Bangkok. I booked it on Agoda. Just go to Agoda and book it. Same thing for Metro Residences. If they do this right, that platform should be able to kind of disintermediate the booking mechanism and all the data that's associated with it. Maybe they'll build their own payment system too. Right. Because, because once you do that, and this is what I was talking about earlier, once you do that, you can make money by having that money, right? Hmm. You pay your properties 30 days later, you take the money straight away from your clients. Mm-hmm. 
afloat. Yeah. Fantastic. And the right place to do it as well, being in Asia, you know. Yeah, as we there's said, no better place. To do this no business. better place. But also, you know, one thing we talked about in the last episode was about the availability of cheap flights in Asia. Wow. You know. Between cities. Oh, yeah. I know. I mean, everybody can fly. <laughs> exactly. Air Asia. It's 100 bucks <laughs> anywhere in Asia, it seems. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I like this. I like this a lot. It's hard to impress me, but this is a platform I think that I could really get behind because I can see the pain point that they're solving on both sides, on the corporate side, on the individual traveler side, and on the property owner side. They're professionalizing something that hasn't been professionalized, and there's, I, I love it. Good. Is that a good note to bridge into the surprise now that you've given us something that you're impressed by? You want to go into the surprise? <laughs> no, you've got more. You want to do the surprise. No, I want to do it. I want to do it. Do the, um, because the, the other thing that I want to talk about, it's going to take too much time as well. And I don't want to, I don't want to drag on too much tonight. Um, but let's do this. So there are a lot of new buzzwords these days, right? Whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, big data, right? Machine learning, it's all this stuff. And, and a lot of this ends up at what people are calling artificial intelligence. Yeah. Right. And I think there is, you know, there's a market for AI, for lack of a better term, and there are places where it can be used. But I think people, I think humans want to interact with other humans, and I think they know when they're not. Hmm. Right? And I understand that, sure, there are chatbots on Facebook for ordering pizza, and if you're going to do something that's kind of a repetitive task, right? I think you're going to want to go, yeah, please send me to Domino's. You just type in, send me my pepperoni pizza at the same address. Yeah. Sure. It charges you, pizza shows up in 30 minutes, you're super happy. Okay? The pizza guy's happy and the pizza girl's happy because they don't want to talk to you and you don't want to talk to them. You're happy to have a robot in the middle just going, yep, you're done on your pizza, your pizza right. shows up, you're happy. As a matter of fact, you'd be happy to have a, an automatically driven motorcycle exactly. deliver it to you without a person on it because you don't have to tip them. It comes hot. They have no attitude. They don't care if it's raining. All these things are great. Love and it. this is a place sure. where automation and artificial intelligence come in super duper handy yeah actually i have to say i would prefer to have a robot in that situation i used to hate phoning up food delivery places it was yeah. just, i used to hate speaking to the people at the end of the phone it's like oh yeah number 42 again it's like the most pointless conversation i ever had it, it is it's a waste of your time it's it a is. waste of time. so i think ai works there and i think you install a chatbot Beautiful. I love that business. And maybe the person who was on the phone now is making the pizza. I, I, I'm indifferent, right? right? I think it's a great use of it. And maybe that was just a college student, so they're not technically as unemployed as the market would like them to be. Right. And then they can study harder as opposed to <laughs> pizza orders, regardless. <laughs> but I think in a place where humans want to talk to other humans – is when it's so obvious that there's a chatbot on the other end, right? So I get emails from people that say um, things like, I want to set up a meeting with you next week. Here are three options. Right. You know, it's someone named Amy. Julie. It's Amy Inverness. And I'm right. like, Amy Inverness, that's weird. What are her initials? Yes. Oh, yeah. Funny. Exactly. AI. Yeah. Really cute. I've heard that. Right, and then they have a male version. It's Andy, like something that it begins with an I, and you're like Andy Intrepid. That feels like a made-up name, you know. And you're just like, once you find out that that's the case, you just kind of want to email back the regular person and go, "Yeah, seriously, am I talking to you or like? I don't want to have a meeting with somebody who sends me the chatbot to arrange it. Yeah, yeah. Because what if I have a chatbot too? The two chatbots are just going to figure this out. <laughs> I mean, it's just not friendly. I mean, I'm sure it's possible to do technically. Right, right. Have you seen those videos on YouTube where they get like Alexa, the you know Amazon Alexa, and they put it next to the Google one, and they just get these things yeah. talking to each other? That's the future. <laughs> that is the future. Going around in a loop. Oh. Yeah. Anyways. I think it's, uh, that's bad practice that people doing that with email. And I know that there are those clients out there. I mentioned one of them, Julie. I think I remember it's like Ask Julie or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't make this up. I've been trying to book a meeting with this guy who's in California, and I sent him a mail saying, you know, we should really catch up and talk. He sent me a mail back saying, yeah, that's a great idea. And I, I said, can you recommend a time? And then, boom, I went right to his artificial intelligence assistant, and it was kind of annoying in a way. Right. Did you know it was the assistant? 
Sure, because it came with a name. I don't want to say what it was, but it came with a name that was so obviously not the name of a normal human. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But this is so. This is what I'm. This is what I'm thinking. I don't think it's going to be a gigantic surprise that a bunch of people are going to invest in companies that do this in places yeah. where it's not really going to work. And I think I hate to say it, but I think one of these things is um, what's it called here? Sales whale. Yeah. Okay. Let's say you work for any kind of company, and let's just say on the off chance you're human. <laughs> Maybe you're not. But let's say on the off chance you are. Human. You want to, and someone's selling you something. Here's my feeling on this, right? Let's say I'm selling you a financial service, mm-hmm. and I send you like five mutual fund choices or whatever it is, and and I send it to you in an automated fashion. So I have an AI thing send it to you, and that AI has like a real name, and let's you know, let's call it Alyssa. It's a nice name, mm-hmm. right? Or if you're in Thailand, it's you know Kanjana, whatever your name is, right? Pick any name; it doesn't matter to me. Once that once that prospect realizes that that's automated, yeah, they feel cheated. I think they're gonna feel really pissed off. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really do. And you can say, you know, I read the news on this, and it says like these they have real names and they look like real people, and I just don't buy it for a second. So Saleswell is an automated sales funnel, if you like, which it, automated in the sense the actual selling part is. Uh, an automated bot speaking to somebody yeah. through email, right? Yeah, so they have – maybe you feed them, I don't know, 100, 1,000, a certain amount of email prospects. And they send out um, emails to them that say something like this. I saw you sign up on our website recently. Would you be free for a Skype call this week? And it has a name like Megan. This is Megan and I just like to – or it's really casual like thanks for your email. Do you know like – Oh, I just don't think once people realize that it's actually not someone named Lucy or not someone named Kate, that they're going to really want to come in yeah, yeah. and actually use this service, right? Because here's what used to happen to me, and maybe this has happened to you too, okay? Somebody named Bill, a real human, again, which is weird in this world, called me and said, look, I, you know, I got your name and I hear you're in the, in the, in the market for financial products. My boss, Tommy, hmm. told me to call you specifically and ask you to set up a meeting with him. He's very busy this week, but could you possibly meet with him next Tuesday at seven o'clock? And it always occurred to me like, that guy is just like a glorified secretary and that's fine, right? And I give that guy a lot of credit for making the phone call because cold calling's hard. Yeah. But the fact that the man who actually is proposing to want to talk to me did not make the phone call himself made it very unlikely to me that I was actually going to call them back yeah. and take them Agreed. It, no. was insult- it was insulting in a way. My boss asked me to call you specifically. It was a lie. Like I knew that was a lie. He didn't ask you to call me. He asked you to call a thousand other people and I just picked up the phone. So I think from an – and they give these sales whale lead generation bots you know, pictures and names like David. Hmm. Okay, And I think once people realize that – like this sounds like a great idea in like a dystopian – technocratic future mm. but i think in the real world for real products where people actually have real questions i don't think they want to be contacted by anybody except the salesperson and i think people are unlikely and maybe their stats are different maybe they say that they get people to call back but even if they do they just find it to be really really strange and you know i'm a tech dude i'm a techie and i'm a geek so the fact that they're using automation you know falls into a whole bunch of stuff that i should normally love but this one in particular i just think and, and, I, and I look at the, um, you know, first of all, the co- company was founded in 2015, according to an article that I read about it in E27, okay, in December. So really, let's give it, it's been running for a year. And they say, to date, they claim that their automated sales assistants have already generated over $1.5 million in pipeline. I don't know what that means. In pipeline. Yeah. In pipeline. That's not, and doesn't mean sales. They didn't say... There is one and a half million dollars in our accounts in the bank. No, it's no. pipeline. It's pipeline, whatever pipeline means. You know, when I was a kid, a pipeline was that thing they used to surf in Hawaii. I love right. watching that. It's really good. Kelly Slater used to do that. I don't know. But I, yeah. I, I remember, I mean, I was a sales guy. I grew up learning sales. That's where I started, selling financial products. I was the guy that picked up the phone and said, hey, Michael. <laughs> but, you know, I was a guy, 
two things there. Firstly, it was humans, and I. One of the first things they taught us was, people always buy from people. That's the yes. first thing. You know, if they don't like you, you can't sell. Doesn't matter if you have a great product, great price. Forget it. It's all about people. That's the first thing. And then the second thing as well, I suppose. You know, this whole thing about Piper. I remember, you know, having a sales organization, having sales guys, and they'd right. sit down and they'd go through their pipelines. So much of it was BS. I was going to say. You know, his pipeline is, this guy said he was going to buy this for $10,000. He didn't actually get the checkbook out and write a check for $10,000, right? No, so it's meaningless. Right. So that's, there's that, isn't there? Which, that, that's a bit suspect to me. But uh, they have only been around for a year, so fair dues to them. It's a bit early yet. Yeah, but I love this wording though, Graham. You know the way I am with this. This stuff makes me laugh. It says, to date, sales well claims that its automated sales assistants have already generated, like it's a big deal, over $1.5 million in pipeline, and here's the killer for me, and $130,000 in closed deals. I love this. I'm not done. For their dozens of customers. Dozens. dozens. Not even like hundreds. Right. If you're going to tell a story, we talked about this you know, in a, on, under a different cover, but like, if you're going to tell a story, tell a story. Yeah. Dozens of customers. Well, dozens of dozens, maybe. We don't know, do we? <laughs> it's just so funny. So it won't be a big surprise for me to not ever hear about this company ever again. Like, I get the whole thing that, like, AI is going to be really popular and there are places where you can really use it. But in this case, I just think, as you said, humans sell things to other humans. Yeah, you I can't don't replace think that. that. Makes me, I don't think that makes me like a guy with a rifle on his on his porch telling people to get off his lawn. <laughs> no. Really, but you're a human being. And I think, you know, there was a, there was a story, sort of backtracking a little bit. We're talking about hotels earlier. You know, there's a hotel here in Japan which only has robots. Yeah, I saw that. Right. And I know people that have been there. I can't remember the name of the hotel. I'm sure somebody can tweet us if they do know the name of the hotel. And people go there for the experience of interacting with the robots. But yeah, the thing is, is that people actually, yeah, it's fun and it's bragging rights and so on. But the problem is that's where it stops. You can't have that as a, an experience with the hotel. Most people have said that actually it's very cold, you know, a robot coming and serving you. It's that they don't actually like that. They'd rather have the cheap immigrant worker coming and serving you because they have a better experience than a robot, right? <laughs> okay. That's the truth, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm not arguing with you. Right, so that's the truth. So they want that human experience. It's why, you know, why is Starbucks more popular than McDonald's? Even though it's both sell coffee, right? It's because Starbucks is about the human experience, right? That's and you know, I'm a great believer in that. You got to create the human experience, and that's why I see these kind of chatbots and email AI sales tools with a little bit of suspicious. Of course, you can use these tools to facilitate the human experience. Sure, that's I have no problem with this at all, right? Right, but not to replace it. That's the turnoff. Like your guy phoning you up and say, hey, Michael, you know, my boss told me to phone you. You know, it's BS, right? Completely. So you, we know. We, we don't like it. We feel we're already suspicious about anything trying to sell to us anyway. So anything that smells like a rat, you know, it's a rat. Right. I mean, and again, you, when you're doing sales, you can oversell stuff, right? Like, hello, Mr. Waits. How is your daughter? You don't give a shit. Like, don't do that to me. <laughs> Unless you've met her and your kids go to school together, like, don't do that to me, right? Don't pretend you're a Red Sox fan. Like, don't do that. And that's exactly what this is doing. It's faking it, and humans yes. don't like faking. Keep it real. Anyway, so I wouldn't be surprised. Again, you know, it's not a big surprise to me. Um, the way this is being marketed, like, it's a Y Combinator thing. Like, everything in Y Combinator is a big deal. Um, like, Y Combinator knows anything about Southeast Asia, um, and I think it's early on the, on the AI front anyway, but I think these investors have just like thrown away their money, but that wouldn't be a new thing anyway. <laughs> exactly. Okay. That's enough for me on that topic, but yeah, that's a big surprise. It is. I'm fully on board with you on that one, Michael. Great show this week. How Thank do people, you. we've all, yes. How do people contact us? I'm sure there's a few things that we throw up this week. I'm sure people are going to take issue with. So great. Let's take issue. We're so, ready. We've got the gloves on. Please do. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Michael Waits. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-W-A-I-T-Z-E. You can 
put comments in at the asiatechpodcast.com. We love when people do that. You can sign up. You can look for me on LinkedIn. You can comment on our YouTube page, Asia Tech Podcast on YouTube. Plenty of places to contact us. If you contact me, I'll contact you back. It won't be his AI bot, Julie. <laughs> no, I have no AI if bot. If it is, then. you know who it is. <laughs> if, it, if it is, call me out. Yeah. Call me out. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.